So I want to touch on on an issue I think that we've we've as a society obsessed over for at least three four election cycles. Right, the idea that that we're in an increasingly polarized environment and that that's potentially bad for us, that we're not talking across lines of difference anymore. And I really want to get two points across. A, that may not be true, and, and polarization or certainly disagreement is not a bad thing, has always actually been a very good thing for us. And then number two, that the one thing that should have brought us closer together, that we're really excited about, meaning the, the advent of, of certainly Web 2.0, but the internet more broadly, has maybe done more to stop us from talking to one another in disagreeing in healthy ways, then it has helped. So let me talk about, about maybe the starting point of all of this. And that's the beginning of this great experiment that the US was supposed to be. And, and, and a lot of us, or a lot of, a lot of commentators rather, continue to be excited about, about the possibility, continue to be ex excited about this experiment. Um, and from the very beginning, if you read the Federalist Papers, if you read what the Founding Fathers wrote, that was the very idea, discussion, disagreement. Um, and even the most cynical people, um, Alexis de Tocqueville, who was a French um, political philosopher um, and wrote very cynically, if you read his work, um, almost mocking uh, this American experiment, how naive Americans were and what they were expecting. But even he was excited about this idea that talk is the soul of democracy. And what he was saying is, look, if we, if we manage to get all the ideas on the table, if we manage to exchange ideas, we ultimately come up with the best solution. Um, and Really, the, the, uh, the, two, the two, I'm putting them both up here at the same time, the two mechanisms, or his, 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 his intuition, was really confirmed by modern social science. And modern social science says talk is important for us for two different reasons. Number one, because it allows us to talk things through. Um, so in other words, if you hear a lecture, if you hear over the course of the semester, you hear 15, 30 lectures, you don't learn quite as much from those 15 and 30 lectures as you may from a study group that you form afterwards. You get together with people who have maybe heard slightly different things in those 15 lectures, who have maybe understood different things than you, and you talk it through. So as a result, collectively, you end up understanding the information better. But it's not just the talking through part. It's not just you getting together and, and, and debating. It's also the anticipation of talk. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is if you're somebody, and again, this is lots of research, including a lot of our own, has shown this. Um, if you have frequent discussions with other people, if you often, if you just regularly engage with them on, on topics, on political topics, one of the things that happens is that that anticipation, the idea that you, the social accountability that comes with it, you know you will have to go to work in the morning and you know that your colleagues will most likely um, engage you in discussions about politics or whatever you watched in the news yesterday, you're more likely to read the news more carefully. So in other words, the, 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 the fact that you're used to having discussions on a fairly regular basis makes you use information more carefully. And social science, again, has shown both of these. So yes, talk matters. And disagreement in all of this is actually a very good thing. The idea that we may passionately, passionately disagree on two things, and, and, and what we're now talking about, we're, we're so polarized we can't talk to each other. No, that's a good thing, and has always been a good thing. In fact, if you look at a lot of our research that looks at, at people's social networks, when we look at who do you talk to on a routine basis, do you talk to people who are just like you, or do you talk to people that are inherently different from you, that have different opinions, that challenge your viewpoints? Do you have heterogeneous or homogeneous networks? And people who have more heterogeneous networks, more different networks, are significantly more likely to A, feel optimistic about their role in democracy, they feel they can make a difference, B, they know more. If you test them on, on knowledge type quizzes, they will actually score better on these quizzes and they will be more participatory, meaning they will be more likely to engage in politics simply correlated to how heterogeneous their, their networks are. And that is a finding that, that holds constant across studies. And that holds constant across studies even in these environments that we keep complaining about, these, these increasingly polarized environments where we apparently can't agree with one another anymore and where we need to get rid of, of the filibuster in the Senate. Um, so and, and if you look, for example, in the last three or four presidential debates, um, in the last three or four election cycles, we've seen the same patterns or we're seeing the same patterns that we've always seen. And that is that over the course of the election, we tend to pay attention to things that, are, that we agree with. Right? If we like Obama, we watch democratically leaning news, we watch the conventions, the democratic conventions. We're much less likely to watch Mitt Romney and the Republican conventions. The debates are really the first time that we're being forced to listen to both sides of the issue. They're the first time where everybody gets equal time. And if I like it or not, if 
I'm a Democrat, I need to listen to Mitt Romney. And if I'm a Republican, I need to listen to Barack Obama. And if you look at knowledge scores over time, that's when they start taking off, right after the debates. Why? Because for the first time, I need to think through issues from both sides of the political aisle, even if, even if I disagree with it. And what's the possible outcome? The possible outcome is, number one, is you tell me something and I passionately disagree with you. I counter-argue and I realize you're wrong. So good, my opinion gets stronger and it gets better because I've just counter-argued. The other possibility is you tell me something that I passionately disagree with and you end up convincing me. What's the outcome? My opinion is better because you actually convinced me with a better argument. The problem with all of the, of course, is, is, is twofold. Number one is we don't like the idea of listening to viewpoints that are not like our own. We self-select out. We don't pay attention, or if we see it, we, we process it in a way that makes us more likely to reject ideas we disagree with um, than ideas we do agree with. But number two, and this is what I put up here, we like to surround ourselves with people that are like us. We like to surround our, we live in neighborhoods with people that are like us, socioeconomically, and that's in part not very surprising because it ends up being that certain neighborhoods price out certain people simply based on income level. Um, but also in terms of politics, um, depending on where you live, you will have a neighborhood that's much more like you in terms of race. So there's, a, it, there's, there's these residential ghettos, to put it, to put it in, a, in a negative term, that we all surround ourselves with. And we tend to interact with people that are like us. And that's not a good thing. It's not a good thing because it undermines all these positive effects. Um, and the internet, in many ways, has made matters much worse. And that's really the surprising thing. Remember, the internet was supposed to be, especially Web 2.0, we had this, this idea that this is this new information commonwealth. Information is now available much more quickly than ever has been. On my mobile devices, on my tablets, I can find more information than ever, quicker than ever before, and wherever I am. So it doesn't matter if I'm in a library or wherever I am. And at the same time, 2.0 allows me to connect with anybody. Not just people like me, not just people who live in my neighborhood who look like me and act like me, but I can connect with anybody all over the world. A completely diverse, heterogeneous network, right? That was the idea, and that continues to be the idea. The problem is we've built an environment that doesn't really help with that, and, and this environment started with long before the internet. It started with cable. Um, if you look at, for example, uh, most of the cable news channels, the profits, that the, the big profits are being made in niche news. They're being made by the Hannity's and by the Rachel Maddow's of this world. They're, made, they're being made by highly ideological news, um, news programming that's essentially tailored toward an audience who already believes what they hear. So if I'm leaning toward the left, I'm watching Rachel Maddow, and if I'm leaning to the right, I'm watching Hannity. And the idea, I hear exactly what I knew all along, and I'm, I'm missing out on all the benefits that I want. But number two is, of course, by using all my news on tablets and whatever else, I provide the best audience data you can possibly imagine. Meaning, news organizations know exactly what I read and what I don't read. I can pretend that I read news about opera and art and science and all these things, but really what I'm clicking on is, the, is sports, and I'm clicking two levels deep on every article about baseball and not about science or anything else. And of course, every click and every minute and every second you spend on every single picture on any news site is being recorded. So in other words, we increasingly end up in an environment where we use algorithms as editors. We don't make editorial decisions based on what the audience should read and what maybe politically we need to think about, but based on what we all do, meaning we get exactly the news that we, we express by every click we want. So we have algorithms as editors. We get the news more and more that feeds already what we're interested in and what we already know, and that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, and then the last one is, of course, that, that in, in social environments in particular, our Facebook profiles look exactly like those residential units that I just talked about. Meaning we surround ourselves in Facebook, on Twitter, and in, in, in all these social media, if that's you know, Snapchat or whatever, Instagram, we surround ourselves with people who are like us. Why is that important? It's important because now if you look at the latest Pew data just a week or two ago, um, people who use social media on Facebook, 40, 50% say that a good chunk of their news comes from timelines. On Reddit, it's up to 60, 62%. Meaning our news more and more comes pre-filtered by the people around us. So it's not just that I don't pay attention what I don't like. It's that I'm also surrounded by people who are just like me and who pre-filter news that then end up in my news feed that's also pre-filtered based on ideology and everything. So we're really living in a more and more ideologically pure news environment. All of us do, if we like it or not. Partly our own fault, partly the social structure around us, and partly the news environment. 
And as a result, we may have just completely forgotten the art of actually disagreeing with one another in a productive way. So we wrote this piece earlier this year trying to figure out, and this is a, an op-ed that came out uh, that we wrote in the New York Times based on our work, uh, where we talked about this idea of the nasty effect, this idea that, that we end up interacting in these online environments without having the slightest clue on how to do it well. Um, and what we ended up doing, what this research was based on, is, is, is a large national survey experiment that we did. So we had 3,500 people um, who all got to read the exact same blog post. This was about a, a, a science and technology issue. It was about nanotechnology, so a, a modification. It's 1 to 100 nanometers. Most people have no clue what it is. Um, but it's, it's, uh, we have 1,500 consumer products on the market. We have um, you know, billions of dollars being spent by corporate, um, um, by federal agencies on, on researching nanotechnology. So we, we gave people a blog post on this issue. And again, we're interested in the idea of learning. What do people extract from this, right? Everybody actually ended up reading the exact same story. Doesn't, it didn't matter which condition you were in. The only thing that differed is that they saw different fake comments that we gave them. Even those comments were pretty much the same. Same content, same arguments, same support in favor or against the technology. The only thing that differed in those comments was how polite people were when they expressed. So I disagree with you, that argument is not valid. I disagree with it, that, that argument is not valid, you idiot. Yeah. Those were the two conditions, more or less. I mean, obviously a bit more complex in terms of the manipulation, but one was not polite, the other one was polite. And here's the kicker, simply the tone of the comments. A, undermined or changed people's interpretations of the article, meaning they were less likely to believe or to find credible the news source underlying it. And number two is the people in the polite and the impolite condition or in the civil and non-civil condition differed significantly in their assessment of the risks of the technology. So in other words, simply how we talk to one another, the tone with which we interact, not the content, not what we say, but simply how we disagree with one another changes our interpretations of scientific facts even. The news that we all used to read by ourselves at the breakfast table now all of a sudden ends up being contextualized. And all of a sudden, simply the tone of interaction, and it's really something that I, that I will say again and again, it's just the tone of the interaction that changes our interpretation of facts. And to just illustrate the point, so this is the, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel was one of the first newspapers that took this story. And it eventually went really almost around the world everywhere. But this is exactly how it was covered. Typical science coverage, small article, bottom of the page, easy to overlook. Right? Well, this is how it came out in the, in the online version. Um, and just to uh, put a little PC plug in there on the PC, that, sh that uh, shadowing over there works really well. Um, so that must be a Mac problem. Uh, you have to cut that out later. Sorry about that. Um, but basically, the, uh, the, what you see in the online version is um, slightly different headline. But here's the point, or here are the points. Already, I immediately know how many people liked it. Over 1,000 people gave it a thumbs up, and how often it was commented on. Why does this matter? This matters because, again, metaphorically, think about this. You used to be sitting at the breakfast table going through a newspaper. Now, you're from a met uh, metaphorically, you're sitting in the middle of a town square reading a paper, and, and anonymous strangers walk by, give you the thumbs up on this article, or yell in your ear why this is good or why this is not good. So this is how we've, how, how the, what the news environment looks like now. Um, and here are just some of the comments. Um, and I just put some of the better ones up there um, um, because they really made the point of our study in the first place, right? This idea of our inability to really interact in a somewhat polite and somewhat civil fashion about things that we've just read. Um, so the pointy-headed scientists, um, those would be us, many of whom are communists and socialists. Um, Wisconsin um, scientists being surprised that their science wouldn't be accepted. And here's my personal favorite by far, um, that if you buy into the conclusion from our study, you must hate God and country. Um, again, the comments being, being you know, what they are, and, and that's exactly the, 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 the problem, and, and it really made our point. But the question is, so what's the solution? I can stand here and say, look, we're, we're moving into an environment, and it's horrible, and we're not learning the way we're supposed to learn. One solution, of course, is, and popular science used our study explicitly and said, look, we're going to shut down our comment functions. Why does this matter, shutting down comment functions? Well, it matters because it's an expensive endeavor to actually moderate comments well. It's a 24-7 it's a exercise, right? Um, it's not cheap. And we've all learned to, to use content online for free. We use Gmail for free, Facebook, and everything else. We watch TED Talks for free. Um, but of course, it's not free. Um, it costs money, and there's large server farms that support any given service and, and, and programming and everything else. So 
one of the one of the things that we now have on top of of the news content, which we've learned to get for free now, now we want the moderation for free as well, and it's really not cheap. But so when they when they shut down their comment section, Popular Science, of course, that kicked just an, kicked, kicked off the next big debate, and and people said, well, that's against free speech, and that that really is is against the very idea of Web 2.0 in the first place. And I agree. But so what then? If that's not the solution, what then are some solutions? Well, the first one is this. This is this is the um, the comment function of Popular Science in the, in the early 70s. Um, and it's called letters to the editor. We've always had them. That's how we used to feedback on media content. Meaning, I write a letter to the editor, it has a 99.9% .9 chance of getting rejected. And if it does get printed, it's highly and, and, and uh, edited. So, and I don't think that's the solution. I don't think the solution is to go back to web you know, 1.05 instead of web 2.0. That's not what I'm arguing. But I want to leave you with maybe three different, um, three different conclusions. Number one is I think we need to take off what I call our virtual ski mask. What's the, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is when I interact with you in a face-to-face -face setting, what ends up happening is when I say something here that, that way oversteps a boundary, I know from your facial expression. I can see from your facial expression if I've said something that I shouldn't have said. And those nonverbals we've developed over hundreds and thousands of years. But for some weird reason, they don't work on, online, or for some very concrete and obvious reasons, they don't work online. So what we don't have there is this immediate social feedback or this immediate, uh, immediate nonverbal feedback. It's like going to a funeral in a red suit. None of you would do that, not because there's a law outlawing it, not because the funeral home says you can't wear a red suit. There's not a little sign. But because you know full well that there's going to be ostracism. That's going to be super awkward. And that, that little person in your head that censors you, that little person is not there online. That little person is, goes to a funeral in a ski mask. It's a lot easier. If I forced you to go to that funeral in a ski mask, and it's a really morbid example, I admit that. But if you did, it's, it would be a lot easier to wear a ski mask, run in, and you know, get out, because nobody would know who you are. Well, that's a little bit what we have here. And it's not that I'm arguing um, that we should all use our full names online. But what I'm saying is that, um, that we need to learn to have that little guy in your head or that little person in your head, that little person, we need to learn how to have that person online as well, that, that, those social barriers. Number two is the, what I called here, and we need to maximize informational serendipity, the idea that we're, that we're running into inf inf information just by chance. And we've set up the system in a way where we don't anymore, where we only watch what we like, where people around us filter for us what we like. And the problem with all of that, is, of course, is that we're, that we're missing out on some of the, of the most interesting information. And what Kafka, Frank Kafka at some point said, you should only read books that pinch and bite you, that use an ice pick on the ice around your heart, that open it up. And, and that's what I mean. That's the idea, the idea that you're being exposed to ideas that challenge what you already know. And I told you earlier what that does. And then the last one, of course, it's the idea that all of this is not a spectator sport. Um, engaging others in disagreement is, it's a little bit like real sports, right? It's, 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 if you sit on the couch and you watch it, you're ultimately getting a little bit more obese, and you're probably really, really ticked off if your team loses. Well, if you go in and you really engage in this, and you engage in this according to the rules and based on you know, previously ag agreed upon rules, you may come out and your shoulder may hurt, or you may be really bruised, but ultimately you end up feeling really good about it, and ultimately this is really what the whole thing was all about, you helping your team win. And, and I think this is exactly what we, what we need to come back to, to, to and the, uh, the very idea from the beginning. And that is we need to figure out as a country a way to express disagreement, um, to utilize disagreement, and, 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 and really reap the benefits of this, this great experiment that we started so long ago. And that's still the best experiment of all of them out there. Thank you.